Good afternoon and thank you so much for joining us for the third webinar in the Offshore Wind series, Learning from the Experts. I'm Adrienne Downey, the Principal Engineer for Offshore Wind uh, with NYSERDA's Large Scale Renewables team. And it is my pleasure to be joined by today's experts, uh, Bill Flynn and his colleagues, John McManus and Aubrey Ohanian with Harris Beach Law Firm who will be giving a presentation on the Article 7 permitting process for offshore wind, which I dare say will be riveting. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, a few reminders for participants and some background on the webinar series. First of all, if you are experiencing any technical issues, please contact Sal Graven at the email address on the bottom of this slide. This webinar is being recorded and the recordings and presentation slides from all the webinars in the Learning from the Expert series will be available on NYSERDA's website at the address on this slide. At this point in time, all participants have been muted. We will have time uh, for Q&A following the presentation, so please use the Q&A function throughout the presentation to submit your questions for the speaker. New York State is working to advance the responsible and cost-effective development of at least 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035. Offshore wind is a critical component in achieving the state's goals of 70% renewable sources of electricity by 2030 and 100% zero emissions electricity by 2040. While offshore wind has been providing clean energy to other parts of the world for several decades now, this industry is brand new to New Yorkers. So to provide interested stakeholders and members of the public with accessible, impartial information and opportunities for engagement on specific topics of interest, NYSERDA is hosting this educational webinar series called Learning from the Experts in order to connect the public with independent experts in key topics in offshore wind. We endeavor to select Learning from the Experts speakers based upon their expertise, not necessarily for an alignment of opinions with NYSERDA or with the state of New York. If you would like to suggest a topic or speaker for a future webinar, feel free to email us at offshorewind at nyserta.ny.gov. Please note that the views and opinions expressed throughout this presentation are those of the presenter or presenters in today's case. And so without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Bill Flynn. Bill is a partner at Harris Beach, where he advises businesses and organizations on energy related matters, strategic planning initiatives regarding economic development, state and federal regulatory affairs, as well as policy decisions. Bill is known for his experience in regulatory policies and legislation related to electricity, gas, water, cable television and telecommunication services. Previously, he has served as chairman of the New York State Public Service Commission, president of NYSERDA, so it's good to see you back, Bill, and chair of the New York State Board on Electric Generation Siting and the Environment, amongst other, many other positions. And with that, I welcome um, Bill to the, the microphone and we'll be more, more than pleased to hand things over to Bill. Bill? Uh, thank you, Adrian. And, uh, and all, as always, thank you for your kind words and Thank you for all the attendees who have uh, been so kind to spend some of your afternoon with John, Aubrey, Aubrey and I. I did have a chance to look at the attendance list and there were some very familiar names and you all know who you are. And there are there many, many more uh, on the attendance list whose names were not familiar to me. So uh, I say to all of you again, thank you. I hope you and your families are, are well and safe during these days. Um, so, maybe, I don't know if um, uh, we're going to be, as Adrian said, uh, but we hopefully are going to be informative to you and hopefully you'll walk away with some, um, some information that you may have not known before or make your jobs easier or uh, just make you more informative of the uh, topic of offshore wind and siting here in, in New York State. And given that it is such an exciting time. Uh, the more people who are involved, the better. Uh, it, it's at this point, I'd like to also uh, introduce two of my colleagues uh, and would be your right, I think, as uh, John McManus. Uh, John and I were the first ones to get together to build our energy team at, at Harris Beach, but soon thereafter, we we're very lucky to bring uh, Aubrey Ohanian onto the team also today. Uh, between John and Aubrey, they are uh, primarily the ones in our team who deal with Article 7 and, and uh, most notably here as it relates to offshore wind in our firm. So they're going to get into a lot of the specifics and, um, and I'll, I'll give a, a overview of where we're going to go and uh, what's a little bit more information about the commission itself for those who, who may not know. 
So could I have the next slide, please? So here's a, a breakdown a little bit about what we're going to uh, discuss today. We'll do a little intro on uh, the PSC and Article 7 under the PSL. We'll do a general overview of the Article 7 process. Uh, we'll then um, talk a little bit more about the review and the representative timeline of the Article 7 process. And uh, near the tail end, we'll discuss some related Public Service Commission filings that would be useful to you. And then what we really want to do is, if there's points of time that we kind of rush through things, it's not that we don't want to talk about the topic more, but we really want to leave some time at the end here for questions from you and hopefully be able to provide you with that, the, the type of information that you can walk away with. Next. So let's, let's get right into it. Um, next slide, please. So a little bit more about the uh, Public Service Commission. Um, they are obviously primarily responsible for deciding the application under Public Service Law Article 7. Uh, historically, the commission is made up of was made up of five members. Uh, the majority of those members would be from the party that's in power in the executive branch, whatever party the governor is from. And each one of those uh, commissioners were appointed by the governor, but they needed to be confirmed by the state Senate. Uh, for those who watched New York closely recently, there was an effort to expand the membership of the commission and which was passed and so that uh, it is able the governor is able to if he'd like uh, to have seven members on the commission now at its uh, maximum the commission can function with less than seven but you do need a quorum to to conduct business presently there are four members um, john rhodes the most recent chairman uh, resigned and the governor name, and he can name any one of the commissioners as his chairman. Uh, and he did so most recently uh, and asked Commissioner Howard to become the interim chair and the CEO. I, I say that both for, for those, is that the commission itself is very chairman centric. And what I mean by that is simply put, they are the chair of the commission of the four commissioners that you see on here that conduct uh, business and make the decisions on a monthly uh, session. But at the same time, the chairman also wears the hat of the CEO of the staff of the Department of Public Service. So, you know, by day, he's the CEO of the DPS. And then uh, during times when he needs to deal with the commission, he's got to put that hat on also. There are three present commissioners along with Chairman Howard, uh, those from top to bottom from uh, the longest uh, longevity is Commissioner Berman, as her term runs through 2024. Commissioner Alessi, uh, in parentheses, I've had the word there, holdover. His term ran out in February of 2021. However, uh, commissioners that historically that whose terms are, are over can stay on and fully operate and function as as though they were inside their term. And uh, until he's replaced, uh, Commissioner Alessi will continue to uh, follow through on his responsibilities. And last but not least from Long Island, which is very important given our topic today, is Commissioner Tracy Edwards. And her term runs at February through February of 2024 also. Um, the last bullet there, of course, is the staff. Uh, the, this is the body and group of people that you would deal with on a daily basis going through this process. Uh, very professional, very capable. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but there are a few people that I do think um, are worth noting in the process. Uh, one of them is the general counsel, Bob Rosenthal. Uh, Bob has practiced and done public service in, in New York State. He's practiced privately. He's back in public service and carrying out responsibilities as general counsel. So that's great background and experience he has from, from both sides in and out of the commission. The top staffer is Tammy Mitchell, who's director of electric, gas, and water. So all the programmatic staff 
are, are answerable in some way, shape, or form to, to Tammy. So she's on the executive staff. Hutan Mulvaney is a director of, of siting. Hutan will have responsibilities, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in the new siting uh, office over at the Department of State, but I'm sure his responsible will bridge from the Department of Public Service over to, to the new office. Uh, Andy Davis, Andy has been with the commission for 30 plus years, very well respected, uh, very professional. And Andy's the lead environmental person on a lot of the siting uh, efforts, not only transmission, but generation. And lastly, out of council's office is Brian Osius. Brian is a manager, managing attorney in the office, uh, but all siting responsibilities, whether that be transmission or generation, and the council who work on that uh, answer to uh, Brian. And then Brian has a direct line to the general counsel, Bob Rosenthal. So that's a, a quick run through of, of the important personnel at the, staff, uh, at the commission and the staff who you would deal with as you go through this uh, process. So at this point, um, I'm gonna turn it over to John and he's gonna take us through uh, the next phase of the presentation, John. All right, thanks a lot, Bill. And thank you also to NYSERDA for hosting this webinar today. We're really excited to be a part of it. And I know my sport coat was excited to get 13 months of dust off it this morning. So thanks for the opportunity for, uh, for that. So I'm going to uh, start off by doing some brief table setting to provide a statutory overview of Article 7, which is the section of the Public Service Law, or PSL, that requires a full review of the need for an environmental impact of the siting, design, construction, and operation of major electric transmission facilities in New York State. Now, the term major electric transmission facilities is one that's defined in the PSL, and um, for purposes of this discussion, it includes uh, lines with a design capacity of 100 kilovolts or more, extending for at least 10 miles, or 125 kilovolts and over, extending a distance of one mile or more. Since most offshore wind farms are gonna be located many miles out in the ocean in federal waters, and their related transmission facilities are going to be transmitting high voltages, the Article 7 requirements are generally going to be triggered for the electric generation facilities associated with an offshore wind farm. And this is evidenced by the two Article 7 applications that have been filed to date with the PSC uh, for offshore wind projects, South Fork and Sunrise Wind. And now is a good point to note that for most offshore wind farms, the only part the only parts that are reviewed under Article 7 are the major electric generation facilities, not the wind farm itself. So, for example, there is not a PSL Article 10 review under the state siting law concurrent with the Article 7 review. Instead, the environmental review of the wind farm uh, is conducted by the Federal Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, or BOEM. And our discussion today is focused on PSL Article 7 uh, and that process, but just so you have some of the nomenclature for this federal element of an offshore wind project, the main document that Bohm considers is the applicant's construction and operation plan, or COP is the term that you'll hear used uh, there. So PSL Article 7, it requires an applicant to apply for a Certificate of Environmental Compatibility and Public Need, uh, or CECPN, uh, which, by the way, you'll find this is one of many <laughs> acronyms and abbreviations you're going to hear uh, throughout this process. We are uh, no strangers to those in the energy world. And the other requirement under Article 7 is for the applicant to meet the PSL Article 7 requirements before constructing any facility. So let's talk about what goes into both of those pieces. So Article 7 applications, uh, the specific application requirements are set forth in parts 85, 86, and 88 of the DPS rules and regulations. And some of the elements that are required in an Article 7 application include the location of the line and right of way, 
a description of the transmission facility being proposed, a summary of any studies made of the environmental mental impact of the facility, including descriptions of such, of such studies, a statement explaining the need for the facility, a description of any reasonable alternative routes, including a description of the merits and detriments of each route submitted and reasons why the primary and proposed route is best suited for the facility, and then a sort of catch-all, such other information as the applicant may consider relevant or the PSC may require. Now, the applicant is also encouraged to include in its application a complete report of its public involvement activities and its plans to encourage public participation. This is known as the Public Involvement Plan, or PIP. Bill and Aubrey are going to discuss this in more detail in a few slides when we get to the pre-application process for an Article 7 application. And when we get to the process, Aubrey is also going to talk about deficiency notices and when an applicant, uh, which occur when an applicant does not meet all of these requirements that I've listed uh, with their initial filing, and then ultimately a compliance determination by the PSC secretary. Now, in order to grant a CECPN, the PSC must determine all of a, the following factors pursuant to PSL 126. As you can see, the basis of the need for the facility, nature of the probable environmental impact, uh, environmental impacts, facility conforming with a long range plan for expansion of the power grid, that the location conforms with applicable state and local laws, and the facility will serve the public interest, convenience, and necessity. So not surprisingly, these statutory determinations match the application requirements that were just listed on the prior slide. So what does meeting these requirements look like in practice? Why don't we take the first one as an example, the basis of the need for the facility. And if you look for the PSC's recent order in uh, granting a CECPN for the South Fork Wing Farm, uh, what the PSC found there was that a need exists for that project to transmit electricity from the proposed offshore South Fork wind farm uh, to a point of interconnection uh, at the East Hampton substation for the applicant to fulfill its requirements under a power purchase agreement or PPA uh, with the Long Island Power Authority, LIPA, uh, and to meet the needs of LIPA's ratepayers. There, the commission further found that the South Fork wind farm, uh, uh, that the project addresses the need identified by LIPA in its 2015 RFP for new sources of power generation that could cost effectively and reliably supply the South Fork of Suffolk County. And the commission further noted that the project will help LIPA achieve its renewable energy goals. So that's just how the PSC uh, determined that need factor was met. And then obviously the PSC would go through those other uh, statutory bases uh, before reaching a determination about uh, granting a CECPN or not. Now is a good time to mention also Article 7's preemptive effect. PSL Section 130 uh, states that notwithstanding any other provision of law, no state agency, municipality, or any agency thereof may approve, consent, permit, certificate, uh, or otherwise condition for the construction or operation of a major facility with respect to which an application for a certificate hereunder has been issued other than those provided by otherwise applicable state law for the protection of employees engaged in the construction and operation of such facility and provided in the case of municipality or agency thereof such municipality has received notice of the filing of the application thereof. So a question comes up with that preemptive effect. How does that jive with the point on the slide that the project must conform with applicable state and local laws? Well, this highlights a distinction between the preemption of procedural permits and approvals uh, under PSL 130 versus substantive compliance with state and local law under PSL 126, and, and here's an easy example. If a municipality has a local ordinance requiring a building permit for a fence and has a fence height requirement, under those circumstances, the applicant would not need to apply for a building permit for that fence, let's say for a, 
a substation or a converter station, uh, if it was a HVTC uh, line, uh, but the applicant does have to substantively comply with the height requirements unless it seeks to have the commission refuse to apply the local law as unduly restrictive. So the PSL uh, basically says Article 7 is where you come for all your permits and approvals, uh, but it does recognize that these other applicable state and local laws should be uh, followed substantively, uh, but there is uh, a hatch available to the PSC and the applicant uh, to uh, refuse to apply these uh, local laws if they're considered unduly restrictive in view of existing technology cost economics or needs of the consumers. So it's a balancing um, of those uh, uh, other state and local laws. So with that overview of the Article 7 legal framework, I will hand off to my colleague Aubrey, who will outline the Article 7 process. Great, thanks, John. And thanks again to NYSERDA for hosting us today. So now that we have kind of the overview of the, the legal framework in mind, will give you kind of a step-by-step -step of the process that applicants will go through to prepare an Article 7 application, file it with the PSC, uh, engage in the procedural processes that have to take place before the Commission can decide an Article 7 application, and some steps that are still required even after you secure your CECPN uh, before you can actually put a shovel in the ground to construct your project. We'll walk through these in kind of chronological order so that it, the information flows here. So before you can file your application with the PSC, there's a, a large undertaking that each of your teams will do. And, and those teams involve your internal development uh, team. It also will involve a lot of external parties. You'll have your legal consultants, your project engineering teams, potentially a separate permitting uh, team and all of those uh, members of, of your broader team will, will come together and they, they'll set a schedule to prepare the application. And they will spend many months going through the process of actually drafting the documents that compile your submission to the PSC. And during that time, you will probably schedule at least one meeting with key agencies involved in the siting process for uh, an offshore wind transmission facility that interconnects with the New York grid. Uh, those agencies typically would in include the, the Department of Public Service, the Department of Environmental Conservation, the Department of State. Uh, in certain instances now, NYSERDA is, of course, a very close partner with certain developers that uh, are selected through NYSERDA's OREC uh, pro program, and they would probably be involved in a lot of those discussions as a result as well. And during those meetings, you'll introduce your project to the, the key members of those agencies and start setting the table for the application that you, you will uh, soon file with the Public Service Commission. And as John mentioned in his earlier slide, although it's not a requirement of Article 7 to include a public involvement plan or a PIP in your Article 7 application, the department has made it clear that th this vehicle that's kind of stems from the Article 10 generation citing process in New York is very helpful for Article 7 applicants to include. And this is really a living and breathing document that uh, the project team will utilize to outline the various stakeholders, the processes they will undertake in order to identify the appropriate stakeholders in their process and the different communication tools that will be utilized in order to engage with stakeholders before an application is filed with the commission and after it's filed. Um, so, so that's definitely a document that we would expect to see a lot of teams preparing for inclusion in your Article 7 application. And before we move on to the actual filing of the application and what that looks like, I'll turn it back over to Bill to provide some additional color around the pre-application process, given its import to the success of the process overall. Uh, thanks, Aubrey. So while all of that pre-work is being done, as, as Aubrey pointed out, there's another uh, process that at least uh, on our team that we highly recommend to developers, which is what I call the due diligence. And what I mean by that is that let's obviously take Long Island, for instance. We've got 3 million people on an island. Um, they are, it's highly sensitive to projects. 
We are going to be potentially building in areas of, of high profile. You have landowners, you have elected officials, um, all those people concerned about what, what is going on in, in their backyard or in their communities. So we highly recommend another effort being done by um, through the public outreach effort, which means identifying those people who are directly or indirectly may be uh, affected by the project itself, uh, by the overall effort of it, whether that be construction or environmental concerns. And there has to be a full core press on identifying those people and meeting with them before any piece of paper gets filed up at the commission. Because I can tell you that if there's one thing that the Department of Public Service is concerned about and interested in, and as is NYSERDA and as is D DOS, et cetera, et cetera, is where is the community? What do they think of the project? Now, they're not looking for 100% support. That would be um, not attainable. However, what they do not want is to have people, whether they, again, be elected officials or uh, people, businesses, not knowing about the project. You are going to have people who are supportive of your project, neutral about your project, outright against your project. But what you cannot have is people who are not aware of your project. Uh, the Department of Public Service has a wonderful public outreach department run by Erin O'Dell Keller, and I should have mentioned her name earlier. She has a wonderful staff. And, and what I mean by outreach is websites, social media, how do you get the word out about your, your project? And they're wonderful to work with, and they're very experienced, and they are not shy about telling you what they expect in terms of outreach into the communities for the project that is coming. So when you have those meetings, beforehand, like Aubrey's talking about, they're gonna be in the room and, and they are just as important as somebody who's worried about construction or noise or, or the height of the project. Um, and they're very resourceful. And they try to do it on a consistent basis, whether it be lessons learned from citing generation or in this instance, citing transmission on Long Island. They'll take those uh, instances they've had in the past tell you what best practices are. I highly encourage you to follow through on what they ask you to do and keep in constant contact with them. If there's meetings, telling them that we're gonna have a town meeting, we're going to meet the county executive. You gotta constantly pump that information into the staff, let them know that you're doing this outreach. So if somebody does have a problem with it, it gets quickly addressed. But if there's anything that I can leave you with is, letting everybody know as much as you can so there, there are no surprises down the road. People will have an opportunity to become active parties in the proceeding as will be discussed in a couple of minutes and they'll have their opportunities to officially weigh in on the aspects of for or against of the project. But that due diligence and upfront effort is arguably the most important thing you, you can do to uh, eventually have it considered for a successful project in front of the commission. So let me turn it right back to Aubrey. Aubrey. Thanks, Bill. So we'll move to the next uh, step in the process here, which is the actual application. And there's, of course, a lot of mechanics that have to go into the, the, the process before you can hit file uh, and send your application over to the PSC. One of the uh, statutorily required prerequisites to filing is that you publish a notice of your intent to file an Article 7 application in a newspaper of general circulation within all of the project areas, both as uh, proposed to be cited and uh, that could be alternative uh, routes for your project uh, once a week for two consecutive weeks prior to your filing. So for folks that are thinking about um, the, the process, make sure that you're thinking about certain statutory steps that you have to take before you even file your application so that those don't uh, catch you off guard when you're right about to file. Once you file your application, uh, or on the day you file your application, I should say, you're likely going to submit both your Article 7 application and any petition that would accompany that for waiver requests of 
of the governing uh, regulations for the Article 7 application. You know, if, if, for example, there's a requirement in the regs that your uh, map submitted with one of your exhibits needs to be of a certain scale and you can't have, you don't have a map at that scale and you have a reason to request a waiver of that requirement, that would accompany your application. Uh, something else you have to have prepared before filing day is an intervener fund check. Uh, that's a, a check that the applicant provides to the Department of Public Service to be held uh, for certain parties to uh, use during the course of the proceeding to fund their participation in the process. And just by way of an example, if your facility requires a new right of way, which many of these offshore wind uh, transmission facilities will uh, and, uh, for 10% or more of its length and your line is between 10 and 50 miles, your intervener fund funding fee would be $100,000. Uh, after you file your application, members of the public will be able to seek party status in your docket. Uh, obtaining party status, as Bill was just mentioning, enables that person or entity to contribute to the development of the administrative record. They will be invited to all procedural and technical conferences. They will be invited to participate in the settlement process. They'll be provided with any and all documents served during the course of the proceeding, just like any agency uh, party would. And, and speaking of agency parties, there are certain uh, entities who are statutory parties to an Article 7 application and will automatically become parties uh, upon your filing. Those include uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation, by way of example, also the Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. Um, and then there is also an ability for municipalities who have been served with the application because the project will uh, be located within their municipal boundaries to join as an automatic party. But municipalities do need to submit a notice of intent to be a party to the PSC within 30 days of receiving notice of the application. So then once your application is on file, there are certain processes and procedures that will take place um, almost immediately. So your application is filed in the Department of Public Service uh, staff will immediately start, well, very promptly, I'm sure, start reviewing your uh, Article 7 application to determine whether you have included all of the information that's required to satisfy the regulatory requirements that John discussed at the beginning of our presentation. If your application does not uh, include all of the required information under the regs, uh, the Public Service Commission secretary will issue what is known as a notice of deficiency, and that will be in the form of a letter. And it will outline what additional information the applicant needs to provide before their application is deemed compliant with Article 7. Uh, if that happens, your team will develop what we call a deficiency response. You'll provide that additional information, and then you will allow staff some additional time to review your additional submission. And the uh, hope would be after that that the secretary's office issues a second letter declaring your application in compliance with Article 7. It's also possible that your application could be deemed uh, compliant right out of the gate uh, and you avoid a deficiency notice, although deficiency notices are, are the more typical approach. Once your application has been deemed complete, uh, it's usually typical at that point that you would have an administrative law judge assigned to your case if one had not already been assigned. And they will pretty quickly schedule a series of uh, events. The first will be a procedural and technical conference uh, where the ALJ will request uh, any and all interested parties to uh, put forth the issues that they see with the proceeding. And they'll also set a schedule for moving forward uh, through an evidentiary hearing. Uh, the ALJs will also schedule public statement hearings uh, and typically, uh, at least in more recent times, public statement hearings are uh, paired with information forums. So those uh, very briefly uh, work where the applicant will provide an overview of the project in what is known as an information forum and members of the public will be able to ask the applicant questions uh, about its project. And then the public statement hearing will begin. At that point, members of the public are invited to provide commentary on the project, and that is not an interactive process with the applicant. Uh, so the applicant wouldn't respond live to any such statement provided during the hearing. It's just an opportunity for the public to make comments for the record. 
Uh, and some ALJs now in Article 7 processes will schedule a site visit to walk the right of way uh, to see where the project will uh, is being asked to be cited. And next I'll turn it back over to John to talk more about what happens uh, after uh, the, the steps I just discussed have occurred and we uh, wind our way to the evidentiary hearing. Okay, thanks Aubrey. So at this point in the process, this is our fourth stage of five uh, that we've laid out for the Article 7 process. And at this point, uh, you would have had your notice of completion. These initial conferences that Aubrey just discussed would have taken place and discovery may be ongoing. And at this point, there are essentially two paths that the application can take, settlement or litigation. And we'll address each of those in turn. So first with the settlement path, that typically begins with uh, what are called exploratory settlement discussions among the parties, uh, where they'll discuss the issues that have been raised uh, and start to see if there is some common ground that could lead to the resolution of those issues uh, through a negotiated settlement. If those uh, uh, exploratory settlement discussions are fruitful and it appears that uh, uh, you know, settlement may be possible, usually the next step is for an applicant to file a formal notice uh, of settlement uh, pursuant to section 3.9 of the Department of Public Services rules and regulations. And that filing kicks off formal settlement negotiations among the settlement parties, which do not have to be the same uh, set of parties. It's a decision uh, to, to uh, move forward with settlement or not. And the ultimate goal of the settlement process to, is to establish the terms of a negotiated joint proposal or JP. And it's important to note that the parties must comply with the PSEs procedural guidelines for settlement if that process starts. Those effectively serve as the rules of the road during settlement. And just a couple of important notes from those settlement guidelines. Uh, the commission pursue, uh, encourages parties to pursue a negotiated settlement where it appears to be in the public interest. And uh, the commission has observed that the settlement process can only work effectively if all the parties negotiate in good faith. So an example of that would be um, that parties should not seek concessions on issues as to which they are reasonably certain that they are unable to join an agreement unless they have informed the other parties. So that's just an example of what's expected with good faith negotiations. Uh, it's important to note that settlements may be of entire cases uh, or it could be just for select issues. And one of the most important requirements uh, that, that must be adhered to during the settlement process is for the settlement negotiations to be conducted in strict confidence, uh, including all discussions, concessions, and offers to settle. Um, the commission has noted that the confidentiality requirement uh, affects the preservation of parties' rights and the integrity of the negotiating process. So that's something that absolutely must be adhered to. Uh, it's policed by the parties, it's policed by the ALJ, and uh, penalties for violating that uh, include being kicked out of uh, the settlement process. So very important to uh, comply with those settlement guidelines. If the parties are able to resolve their issues concerning the application, they will agree to sign and file a JP with the commission. And the usual next steps after that include the drafting and filing of statements in support of the JP with the commission. Uh, there may be reply filings after that. Uh, and uh, there could be uh, an evidentiary hearing after that concerning any uh, disputed issues of material fact uh, with any potential non-signatory parties or issues that were not resolved in settlement. So let's take a look at the litigation path. So here parties will have filed pre-file testimony on certain disputed issues. Uh, parties may file rebuttal testimony and uh, they are likely, excuse me on that. And parties are, uh, uh, will participate in an evidentiary hearing and then file initial briefs and reply briefs if necessary after that. 
uh, following that briefing schedule, the ALJ makes a recommendation for the commission's consideration. And that document uh, containing the recommendation uh, may be, but is not required to be issued to the parties to provide further briefing. If it is issued to the parties, it's known as a recommended decision or RD. Uh, and there will typically be briefing on that as well. And those briefs are referred to the briefs on exception and then briefs opposing exception uh, is usually the briefing process that those follow. So whether you go settlement or you go the litigation path, ultimately this ends back at the PSC, which issues a final decision on the CEC PM. And uh, if it's been a negotiated resolution, uh, the PSC settlement guidelines, again, come back into play. And those provide that uh, decisions on the JP must be just and reasonable and in the public interest. And a few of the factors that the PSC considers in uh, rendering that decision are whether the joint proposal is consistent with the law and regulatory, economic, social, and environmental state and commission policies, whether the terms of the JP compare favorably with the likely result of a fully litigated case and produce a result within the range of reasonable litigated outcomes, whether the joint proposal fairly balances the interests of ratepayers, investors, and the long-term soundness of the utility, and whether the joint proposal provides a rational basis for the commission's decision. Now, if a party is dissatisfied with the commission's decision on uh, a CECPN, uh, that party or parties may apply for rehearing within 30 days of the written decision. That's with the PSC again. And after that, judicial review may be pursued in the appellate division. And that petition for rehearing, by the way, is a prerequisite to someone seeking uh, judicial review of the um, CECPN. Uh, I'll go through this real quick. Uh, Post certification, usually the next biggest step that comes after the granting of the CECPN is the filing of the Environmental Management and Construction Plan, or EM and CP. Uh, the EM and CP details the precise fuel location of the facility and the special precautions that will be taken during construction to ensure environmental compatibility. Uh, and those have typically been worked out in the JP beforehand. Um, usually our right of way acquisition is complete at this time and construction will begin following approval of the EMCP, issuance of a water quality certificate and notice to proceed. And with that, I will uh, hand back to Aubrey uh, and she's gonna walk us through a representative of timeline of an article seven application. Great, thanks John. So just to give you all a visual of some of the steps that we've talked about today, we've prepared a, a general timeline of the processes that you would undertake from pre-application preparation through certification. So I'll extend the timeline here so folks can see uh, kind of from beginning to end, but uh, there are some, some milestones here that you might find helpful as you're uh, thinking about the Article 7 process after, after this presentation, including uh, some, some tips from uh, past experience that you should uh, try and make sure that at least a month before your filing, your pens are effectively down on your application so you ensure enough time to print and prepare the many, many service copies you will need to deliver to various stakeholders. These applications are you know, typically around the, our last offshore wind uh, filing was over 2000 pages for an application. So reserve enough time to prep that beforehand. Uh, some some uh, estimated timelines that you could expect or timeframes between certain activities, for example, approximately two months for a Department of Public Service staff to review your application and issue any deficiency notices that are required. And then one other uh, helpful note perhaps is a recent uh, amendment to the public service law that does require Article 7 applications to be decided 12 months after uh, they have been deemed complete. But the, the next slide that I'll put up here uh, does provide uh, for some uh, modification to that timeline. If you uh, notice settlement discussions, that 12 month time frame can be told. And it also can be told under uh, certain other situations, including by extension, 
uh, upon consent of the applicant. Uh, and I think to close it out here, I'll turn it back over to John very quickly just to mention a few other related PSC filings that folks should keep in mind if they're considering filing an Article 7 application with the PSC. Thanks, Aubrey. Just so really quickly, a couple of the other common filings that are made uh, by an applicant in connection with an Article 7, uh, CCPN uh, is one under PSL 68 for a Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity a CPCN, so not to be confused with the CECPN, uh, the applicant will also likely uh, seek light in the regulation at that point. Depending on the financing for the project, the applicant may seek uh, financing approval under PSL 69. And finally, if there's the transfer of any uh, utility property, so for example, to access um, a substation for the interconnection, uh, there may be a PSL 70 filing. So with that, I will turn things back over to Bill for some closing thoughts, and then we'll open up the Q&A portion of the presentation. Thanks, John, and, and thanks, Aubrey. So um, we went through this pretty darn quick. So um, there, there's a lot in here. Um, there's a lot in between the lines that need to be done. No project is like the next project, so there's always the nuances that you have to deal with also. I will say this about uh, and and thank NYSERDA for putting this together, but NYSERDA, and I'm a little biased here about NYSERDA, of course, but NYSERDA is one of the, if not the best state entity to work with. And the fact that, you know, they have the OREC program and they are choosing developers to work with, their frame of mind on these is they, they are a partner with you. You need to treat them as you would if you if they were a co-developer. Obviously, you have to deal with the DPS, but in the offshore wind effort, um, NYSERDA is going to be as concerned as interested in the process. Um, they have a whole unit at NYSERDA to do energy analysis and metrics, and those metrics feed into the programs, and those metrics that you do from your project feed right back to the commission from their orders of the monies that they've had to be collected. So it, it's a it's a partnership that you have to deal with NYSERDA uh, on a, a constant basis. So as much as you're keeping in touch with DPS and other state agencies, and like I said, the locals, uh, NYSERDA is, a, is obviously uh, a must. And Adrian, and under the leadership of Doreen Harris and others, um, you can't find much better than that. So um, again, thank you to Adrian and your team for having us here today. And if there are any questions, uh, John, Aubrey, and I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Bill, Aubrey, and John, for this really exceptional presentation. Uh, we said it was going to be riveting, and indeed, uh, I think I think we robustly delivered. Um, you know, just to echo on on some of what uh, Bill was just describing. You know, regardless of your perspective, whether you're a member of industry, a stakeholder, or a community member, it is is truly important um, to understand the diligence and rigor uh, of the regulatory and permitting processes that underpin our state's approach to. A, to uh, responsibly advancing offshore wind. Um, as you aim to learn more about this resource uh, and about potential projects and when and how and where you can get involved, we sincerely hope that this webinar and the timeline in particular that uh, the Harris Beach team has just outlined will help to enable you to get involved. Um, so with that, we're gonna turn to some Q and A. Uh, so hopefully uh, we can get a few in here before, uh, before we come to time. Um, uh, hopefully a simple one, uh, Aubrey, um, but uh, to kick us off, there's a, a question here for you uh, as to the process for coming up, uh, becoming a party. Can you describe that please? Sure. So the, the typical process is that there's a, a party request form that can be filed. Uh, they're, they're found electronically on the PSC's website and you have to provide uh, a, a relatively nominal uh, amount of information in order to request that status in the first instance, your name, contact information, and generally what your involvement in the proceeding would be and, and the general threshold for admittance is that you will in some way advance the administrative record in the proceeding. Uh, so once you fill out that form, you uh, provide it to the PSC secretary's office and you also serve it on any then active parties to the proceeding. Uh, the then active parties do have an opportunity within a 10-day period to object 
to that request and absent objection, uh, depending on where you are in the regulatory process, you will just automatically be accepted as a party. The one caveat I'll add to that is if you request party status before the first procedural conference, uh, the administrative law judge will formally uh, move any uh, parties into the proceeding at that point that requested status before the procedural conference. Afterwards, you're just automatically made a party. And I will, I will add also, uh, Adrian, that uh, if you are a stakeholder in the Article 7 process and you receive notice of the application that the applicant is required to provide you uh, when they file their application, that notice should and, and will uh, outline exactly how you become a party. Great. Thank you. Um, and a related question, just in quick follow up here um, regarding party status, are, are municipalities located adjacent to an offshore export cable uh, able to claim party status, or is it just the municipalities where the cable makes landfall and the upland municipalities that the, 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 the uh, cable passes through? Typically, it's just the municipalities that are actually in, uh, impacted by the project in terms of the, the physical project running through the municipal boundaries. If there is a municipal boundary that's close, uh, you, you may uh, find that staff is will recommend that that municipality be affirmatively served with a notice of the application. Uh, but just because a municipality is not uh, going to be uh, hosting the facility does not mean that they couldn't uh, seek party status in, in an application proceeding. Great, thank you. Um, a question here, uh, the law excludes underground transmission lines in a city with a population in excess of 125,000. Um, how do those projects get licensed and permitted instead? Yeah, that's uh, locally, uh, but with offshore wind, uh, you're likely not going to have a situation where you just got uh, underground electric lines within a city of that size. Um, so, for example, the, the two that are out there right now, you count their um, uh, the length of their transmission line that's in New York State territorial waters, which extend out three, three nautical miles. Uh, and then, of course, that may not be a direct shot. It could be sort of circuitous to get there as well. So in all likelihood, before you even get to the city, you're going to have several miles of uh, transmission cable that are going to trigger, uh, trigger the Article 7 requirements. Great. Thank you. Um, another question here. Uh, can you speak more about the decision making or approval processes that exist between DEC and the Public Service Commission to so the Department of Environmental Conservation, excuse me, uh, and the Public Service Commission? Uh, it was mentioned that a water quality certification needs to be issued. How does this approval relate to any other in uh, waters or tidal wetland permits? So in the Article 7 process, it's a little bit of a unique uh, wrinkle on the typical water quality certification process. If you file an Article 7 application, it's actually the Department of Public Service that issues that water quality certification, not the Department of Environmental Conservation, as you might typically expect to be the case. Uh, so that is a DPS function in the Article 7 process. Uh, otherwise, during the pendency of the application, we would, of course, expect the DEC to be very involved in the application review and consideration process. Uh, they are, uh, as far as I'm aware, almost always a very active party in the proceedings. They'll be very involved in the settlement discussion uh, and will provide all uh, feedback that they feel is necessary to ensure that the application's environmental impacts are uh, robustly and thoroughly considered during the process. Great, thank you. Switching gears here, and, and this is uh, um, uh, particularly, I think, the latter half of the question, um, very, very relevant, um, but um, uh, can you provide clarity on the timing of the, the BOEM review process uh, for offshore wind component um, and its intersection with the land-based Article 7 process? Um, are these typically concurrent or are these sequ sequential reviews? They are concurrent. Um, is there any engineering required in this process? Yes. yes. Oh, I, I was just going to say, typically, the more of the engineering, 
there is an engineering component you'd see in some of the exhibits that are filed as part of the Article 7 process. Uh, but the really in the weeds engineering takes place during the EM and CP phase that I talked about, which is post certification. Uh, that's where the really detailed engineering drawings are submitted for uh, staff and ultimately commission review and approval. Thank you. All right, we might have time for one or two more here. Um, is an applicant uh, required to pursue a negotiated settlement or can an applicant move directly to litigation? Yeah, there's no, no requirement to uh, resolve this through a negotiated settlement. Uh, it is very much a path. It's a decision. Uh, I would say that the vast majority of um, these Article 7s, except for smaller ones, but anything of this scale uh, is, is likely going to uh, go into the, the settlement path. Now, it may remain to be seen how some of that shakes up with the new changes to Article 7. Uh, for example, the 12 month time period uh, is still uh, relatively new. So we'll see if some applicants decide uh, that they would rather pursue um, their CECPN on that 12 month schedule and not having the tolling uh, that would accompany uh, uh, the decision to go into the settlement process. And then when you get into the new expedited siting process, uh, the, the regulations for which were just issued uh, about a week or so ago by the PSC, that actually has a nine month review process. So it will be interesting to see uh, as more applications are filed under the uh, 12 month process and probably even more so under the nine month expedited siting process, uh, if uh, negotiated settlements and JPs uh, remain the norm, or if some people decide to uh, move forward on uh, the quote unquote litigation path. Great, thank you very much. And one uh, very, very last question to, to close us out um, before we look to uh, to our next next webinar here in the series. Can you please provide clarity as to the role of the Office of Renewable Energy siting uh, in this process? Yeah, it's really none in this context with the Article 7 process. That that office is really uh, focused now on the siting of generation and in very limited instances associated transmission. Uh, but because, as John mentioned at the beginning of the PowerPoint, the uh, generation facilities here for offshore wind are not going to be cited by uh, any New York siting board. Uh, they really will not be involved in your Article 7 process. Excellent. Thank you very much. So that closes out our Q&A portion. Um, again, sincere thank you uh, to, to each of you for your time today and sharing your expertise. Um, and if we can bring up the last slide, please. Excellent. Thank you so much. So as we close today, uh, again, sincere thank you to all of our attendees for joining us for this, uh, this latest installment of the Learning from the Experts webinar series. Uh, again, as a reminder, uh, this webinar has been recorded and the presentation and slides will be made available uh, within the coming weeks at uh, offshore wind, uh, or excuse me, uh, nyserta.ny.gov slash OSW webinar series. Um, looking to the future, our next webinar in the series is going to be on May 12th. We'll be joined by Hannes Pfeifenberger with the Brattle Group, who will be providing an overview of offshore wind transmission systems. And on May 26th, uh, Duncan so Sokolowski with Tetra Tech will describe um, the submarine uh, cables that bring energy generated by offshore wind turbines to shore. So an interesting extension of, uh, of this applied process that we've been hearing about today um, and to discuss technical considerations in cabling designs and planning. So please uh, join us by registering for this and future webinars through our events page at win.ny.gov. And if you have re requests for future topics as well as feedback uh, generally, please, by all means, uh, feel free to reach out and contact the entire NYSERDA Offshore Wind team. We are here at your, um, at your pleasure, offshorewind at nyserta.ny.gov. Thank you all very much again and uh, wish you all an excellent rest of the day.